Good evening aspirants, welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 5th of January 2022. Displayed here are the list of news articles chosen for today's discussion. See, as I said in my previous video, I have discussed an economic topic relating to the second news article and also I have discussed two mains news article and interested aspirants can utilize those points for your mains answer writing. Now without wasting much time, let's get into our discussion. Look at this first news article. See this is an editorial article. This is with reference to a public notice issued by the Ministry of Home Affairs. See the notice extended the validity of Foreigners Contribution Regulation Act Registration Certificates that is FCRA Registration Certificate of NGOs that were expiring. See the date that it expired was September 29, 2020. Now it is extended to March 31, 2022. Also they put a condition that this extension is provided only for those NGOs whose request for renewal had not been rejected. See in our Hindu news analysis on the day 29th of December 2021 a detailed discussion is made regarding this FCRA registration. So, now today in this context, we will learn about what is an NGO and what are all the roles of NGOs and the issues faced by NGOs, especially the financial issues. The syllabus relevant for this article is highlighted here for your reference. Please go through it. Now, let's start our discussion. See, first of all, let us see what is an NGO. See, it is a non-governmental organization. And it is also a non-profit group that functions independently of any government. See, these NGOs, sometimes called as civil societies, are organized on community, national and international levels. Okay. See, this aims to serve a social or political goal, such as you can say humanitarian causes or any environmental issues. See, NGOs are registered under the Societies Registration Act, which is a central act for registering organizations that are not for profit registration. Now, let's discuss about the functions of these NGOs. See, basically, NGO act as a mediator between the government and the citizen. See, when few issues does not reach the government or not solved by the government, then functions of NGO play a significant role in solving those issues. So, what they will do? They ask for greater efficiency, delivery and accountability from the state. Like they ask for rehabilitation and compensation in the case of land acquisition. And see, mainly they work that is, their main work is aiming to make the government set up a great accountability framework. For example, a movement was led by Masdur Kizan Shakti Sangathan at Rajasthan which demanded for the right to information. Not only this, these NGOs also help in correcting the extractive nature of markets. See, for example, when rights of tribals are violated, like uh, through illegal land acquisition by any corporate companies, these NGOs will come into play. Now, apart from this, these NGOs also ask for environmental accountability and justice for the underprivileged people. See, now let's see what is the main focus of these NGOs. They will mainly focus on the issues concerning human rights, social issues, environmental issues and those that is violating the democracy. See, they work to promote and improve the social and political conditions of the society on a broader scale. Now, let's see some more functions of these NGOs. See, they help in the protection of human rights and child rights. They help in eradicating poverty. They help in protecting the animal rights. They prevent social injustice. They help in environmental conservation. They provide routine care for aged people. They also help in women empowerment and disease control and others. They help in implementation of health and nutritional plans of the government. Not only this, they also help in implementation of educational plans, thereby they help in improving the literacy rate. And few more functions are listed here for your reference. See, for your understanding, take NGOs that were functioning during COVID-19 pandemic. 
they played an active role in migrant crisis they distributed relief materials and established sheltered homes so they even worked parallelly with the government in providing medical aid so their participation became very crucial in tackling the crisis right now let us focus on the issues that are faced by these ngos especially the financial issues first let us see the current financial issue which is about the requirement of foreign funds why do ngos require foreign funds see you know that causes have no boundaries at all so funding for such socially desirable causes could come from beyond borders right for example the humanitarian work by the missionaries of charity is beyond the capability of many state governments therefore foreign funding is required to carry out humanitarian work which will benefit the society at large scale and so foreign funds need to be encouraged now let's see few more issues faced by these ngos see some of the major issues faced by ngos include politicization of ngos poor governance and networking and misuse of these funds some ngos are also involved in violations that seem to threaten the sovereignty of the country see this is evident from crimes such as money laundering subversive activities and violation of the other laws see in the beginning of the discussion we mentioned about this fcra registration right so what is this fcra registration fcra registration is mandatory for any ngo or association in order to receive foreign funds or donations already i mentioned that in our news article discussion on 29th december a detailed discussion is made on this fcra but today we'll see the three important amendments that were brought in fcra act which in particular have bothered these ngos what are the three amendments see first one is opening a pass through bank account in a specified branch in new delhi then stopping ngos from transferring foreign grants to other registered ngos and the third one is lower the cap on administrative expenses let us see why these three amendments bother ngos see each of these has significant financial and compliance implication for ngos for example many ngos that were working in the remote areas which had no direct access to international funding were functioning through the donations from larger ngos this has been stopped now which threatens the very existence of those ngos in the remote areas so look at the pie chart given below about 90% of ngos don't have access to big foreign grants also we saw that the cap on administrative expenses were lowered from 50% of the foreign funds to 20% see the ngos argue that this is a needless micromanagement as the cost structure vary from project to project See, in 2018 to 19 there were nearly 1328 ngos whose administrative expenses exceeded 20% of their total foreign funds so the ngos argue that the depth and the variety of the work of a civil society organization cannot be captured in the annual returns filed on the fcra portal and there needs to be a study on how many civil society organizations lost their permissions some lost permission only because the predetermined drop downs given by the fcra portal were unable to capture the work of the organizations how cruel is this right see the idea of distributing clothing was done by a ngo gunch these initiatives cannot be put into specific business plans spreadsheets or governmental schemes they therefore need a grant based cost based revenue stream model that's all regarding this editorial so we saw what is an ngo roles of the ngo functions of an ngo and we saw the major issues faced by ngo especially the financial issues and we also saw about few other issues faced by ngos now let's move on to the next news article discussion this news article mentions that the atel payment bank has become a scheduled bank So today let us briefly understand what is a payments bank and a scheduled bank. See basically the banking system of India is broadly categorized into two. 
they are commercial banks and cooperative banks and our central bank that is RBI exercise regulatory and supervisory control over them under these two heads we have varieties of banks but our focus is on commercial banks today okay see these commercial banks are further classified into three based on ownership pattern they are public sector banks private sector banks and foreign banks here note that foreign banks are also private banks apart from this we also have domestic private banks see this is further sub categorized as universal banks differentiated banks and local area banks when we say universal banks it means they undertake all kinds of banking activities financing activities and other related activities but differentiated banks are distinct from universal banks because they function in a niche segment that is they provide particular products or services that appeal to a small specialized section of the population mainly they are differentiated from the universal banks on the basis of capital requirement scope of activities or area of operations so differentiated banks offer a limited range of services or products or they function under a different regulatory dispensation here remember that only since 2015 rbi issues licenses for these differentiated banks alongside the licenses for universal banks and the payment bank that we wanted to discuss today is actually a differentiated bank and the guidelines for this was issued in 2014 and the licenses were granted in the year 2015 see its main objective is to further the financial inclusion how it will be done this will be done by providing small savings accounts and payments or remittance services see these services are provided to the migrant labor workforce low income households small businesses and organized sector entities and other users see if you notice these are underserved and unbanked population in the country right so by involving them in the banking system rbi is trying to further the financial inclusion see look at the features of the payment bank you can just go through it now see in the news article it was mentioned that this atel payment bank has become a scheduled bank right so we saw in the beginning that commercial banks are classified based on the ownership pattern but they are also classified based on regulation as scheduled banks and non scheduled banks see both are regulated under the banking regulation act 1949 but what is the major difference between the two see the scheduled banks are the banks included in the second scheduled to the rbi act of 1934 so according to the payment banks guidelines a payment bank will be given scheduled bank status once it commences operations and is found suitable as per section 42 clause 6a of the rbi act 1934 see this section no provides the conditions based on which a bank can be included in the schedule so what are all the conditions there are three major condition first one is the bank should have a paid up capital and reserves of an aggregate value of at least 5 lakh rupees second condition is it should satisfy the rbi that its fis are not being conducted in a manner detrimental to the interest of its depositors third condition it should be one of these institutions like it should be a state cooperative bank or a company as defined in the section 3 of the companies act 1956 or it should be an institution notified by the central government in this behalf or it can be a corporation or a company incorporated by or under any law in force in any place outside india see it seems that this atel payment bank has satisfied these conditions so it has been included in the second schedule to the rbi act and has become a scheduled bank see this upgrade has many benefits such as now the atel payment bank can take part in request for proposals issued by the government and can take part in primary auctions etc that's all about this news article now let us move on to the next news article discussion this news article mentions that 
In the past three months, the highest number of COVID-19 cases on a single day was registered yesterday. Because of this, many states have increased the curbs. So today, let us brush up some basics about the disease levels such as pandemic, epidemic and endemic. Basically, these levels tell the spread of the disease and rate of new cases. First, let us take endemic. See, it refers to the constant presence or a usual prevalence of a disease or infectious agent in a population within a geographical area. Here, the disease remains at a steady state but do not disappear from a population. For this, you can take chicken box as an example. See, it occurs at a high but predictable rate among the youngsters. Now, the level of cases here will be the baseline level or endemic level. That is, endemic level refers to the amount of a particular disease that is usually present in a community. So, the disease may continue to occur at this level indefinitely. Therefore, this is often regarded as the expected level of the disease. But when this level increases or the amount of disease in a community rises above this expected level, then this leads to epidemics and pandemics. So, epidemics refers to an increase in the number of cases of a disease above what is normally expected in that population in that area. Here, the increase is often sudden and is confined in a certain region and one or several communities are affected by this disease. Now, when this happens in a more limited geographical area, it will be called outbreak. Best example for epidemic is the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. See, it killed nearly 11,300 people between the year 2013 and 2016. Then what is this pandemic? See, it is also an epidemic, but this epidemic has spread over several countries or continents. That is, its spread is global and is affecting a large number of people. Okay. See, we can also say that when simultaneous epidemics occur in multiple locations across the globe, then it is called a pandemic. Here we have a quick moving pathogen that is spreading across the globe okay and it has a potential to kill tens of millions of people see it can also disrupt economies and destabilize national security that is why pandemic pose major health social and economic risk see this epidemic becoming a pandemic in this era is easy why because of increased global transport urbanization and overcrowded conditions See, the best example could be COVID-19, which has spread quickly across the globe, affecting health and economy. See, you should also know that epidemics, including pandemics, end in two ways. First, all chains of disease transmission are broken and the cases have come to zero. Second, the disease becomes endemic, that is, it becomes an ongoing part of the infectious disease landscape. See, for this you can take tuberculosis as an example, which was an epidemic once and now is an endemic. See, scientists are worrying that COVID-19 pandemic will also continue as an epidemic. That's all about this news article. Now, let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now, look at this news article. See, this news article reports that Indian soldiers at Galwan Valley have celebrated their new year by holding Indian flag. As you all know, this is disputed Himalayan border region between India and China. So today, let us see its geographical location and strategic importance in this discussion. Okay. See, the valley refers to the land which is present in between the steep mountains through which Galwan River or Galiwan River flows. This Galwan River has its source in Akshay Chin on China side of the line of actual control. See, the main stream of the Galwan River rises near the Depsang Plains at the elevation of over 5000 meters. This plain is the western extremity of the Akshay Chin. A rough depiction is given here for your reference. Just have a look at it. 
See, this Galwan River is an important tributary of Chipshab River, which in turn drains into the Shyok River in the northeastern part of Ladakh. Here you have to note that it meets the Shyok River on India side of the line of actual control, and Shyok is an important tributary of Indus River. See, because of this, some sources also say that Galwan River is a tributary of the Indus River. You should note that the line of actual control lies to the east of the confluence of the Galwan and Shyok Rivers in the valley. So, the Galwan Valley is strategically located between Ladakh in the west and Akshay Chin in the east. This part of Akshay Chin is currently controlled by China as a part of its Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. So, previously both India and China have been patrolling the valley, but after June 2020, the scenario changed when China started claiming the entire valley as its own. This resulted in the frequent standoffs between Indian and Chinese army in the valley. See, this valley, you know, is strategically important for India as it helps Indian army to maintain its position against China in the region. Particularly, this Galwan River enables China to control the Shyok Road passes, which are close to the river. By controlling this, China is maintaining its hold on Akshay Chin. So, if India gets full control of the valley, this will threaten China's position in the Akshay Chin, right? See, additionally, the valley is also important as India is trying to build feeder roads to the Darbuk Shyok Village Daulat Beg Oldi Road. See, this road no runs along the Shyok River, and it is crucial for communication close to the line of actual control. And it is a crucial connect between Leh and Daulat Bed Oldi. See this Daulat Bed Oldi is the northernmost corner of the Indian territory in Ladakh. It is also at the base of the Karakoram Pass that separates China's Xinjiang Autonomous Region from Ladakh. Plus, you have to remember that this Daulat Bed Oldi has the world's highest airstrip. So Chinese occupation of Galwan Valley will threaten this road and will threaten route to Daulat Bed Oldi. See that is why holding Galwan Valley is important to India. Now that's all about this article. See remember the location of Galwan Valley for attempting map based prelims questions and the points regarding the strategic importance of this Galwan Valley can be used in your mains answer. Okay. Now let's move on to our last article discussion. Now look at this last news article. This is with reference to the meetings of the Home Minister with the DGPs of the states. See, in this meeting, the Union Government asked the states to share more intelligence inputs through the multi-agency center. So, in this context, we will learn about the multi-agency center and its functions. What is this multi-agency center means? See, MAC or multi-agency center is a common counter-terrorism grid under the Intelligence Bureau. MAC was established in the year 2001 following the Kargil War. In the MAC network, intelligence inputs are shared regularly by various intelligence agencies on real-time basis. See, as many as 28 organizations, including the Research and Analysis Wing, Armed Forces, and the State Police, are part of this platform. See, there were focus group meetings on cross-border terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir and Northeast. Then on the left-wing extremism, Northeast insurgency. So during these meetings, the intelligence inputs are shared and discussed with the concerned agencies or state police. So this is the way they are using the shared intelligence inputs. See, all the MAC member agencies, including state intelligence, state police, are connected to a national memory bank, which is a central data bank for counter-terrorism-related information. In the year 2009, the functioning of the multi-agency center or MAC in the intelligence bureau has been strengthened and revamped. How do they do? See, the multi-agency center should function 24 into 7. This has been advised in order to share intelligence with all other agencies, including those from the states. Also, all other agencies have been asked to share intelligence with the MAC. See, there are around 400 secured sites connected with the MAC headquarters. 
द मैक ईल्ड गुड रिजल्ट इन दर टू थाउजेंड एंड ट्वेल्व सी दे मैनेज टू टू कैच सम ऑफ द बिग फिश लाइक साइबुदन अंसारी एंड अलिया सबू जिंदाल हु आर द इम्पोर्टेंट मेम्बर्स ऑफ द लक्षरी तैबा विच वॉज अ पार्ट ऑफ मुंबई टेरर अटैक्स See the MAC receives most of its intelligence inputs from the central agencies and state agencies. According to the Parliamentary Committee report, the major contributions of inputs to the MAC in the year 2016 were the Defence Intelligence Agency, which was around 24.05 percentage, and the Research and Analysis Wing, which contributed for about 20.75 percentage of the input. So what is the problem here the contribution from the state special branches was low that was around 11% only see remember the state police forces have their own intelligence and counter terrorism units but these are often weak and work in an isolated manner the states are also often reluctant to share information on this platform see there are several gaps in sharing critical information at the right time so this is the problem here so remember all the states no will have a subsidiary multi agency center which is called a smac located in the state's capital though mac existed to share information among various agency it was not being implemented effectively okay so plans were put forward to link the system up to the district level so for this purpose no intelligence bureau is contemplating to extend the connectivity of the subsidiary multi agency center that we mentioned above to the districts in a phased manner so what they have planned they have planned to connect the smac to the district level but in a phased manner so as mentioned in this news article the meeting by the home minister with the dgps of the states will give a necessary push to the state's contribution to mac that's all about this news article see the points that we discussed in this particular news article can be used for your mains answer writing especially when questions are from the internal security so you can mention it as an example in your answer for questions related to strengthening of internal security etc okay now let's discuss the answers for our prelims practice questions See take this first question it is about the payment banks it is talking about the features of a payment bank see do you remember that i just asked you to go through the features of the payment bank in our discussion but now we'll see it in an elaborate manner and then we'll come back to the question okay see the first feature is payment banks are registered as a public limited company under the companies act 2013 next they are licensed under section 22 of the banking regulation act 1949 third feature they also have specific licensing condition that restrict its activities so they can only accept demand deposits that is current deposits and saving bank deposits and can provide payments and remittance services next condition nri deposits are not permitted okay further initially payment banks were allowed only to hold a maximum balance of rupees 1 lakh per individual customer this limit is enhanced to 2 lakhs in april 2021 then they can issue atm or debit cards but cannot issue credit cards because lending by payment banks is not permitted next the entities such as the non banking financial companies mobile telephone companies etc may apply to set up this payment banks see that is why atel could set up their own payment banks called as atel payment banks see the payment banks can set up their own branches and atms okay now the last condition they are also permitted to undertake utility bill payments on behalf of its customers and general public now shall we go through the question see the first statement it provides payments and remittance services yes it is correct look at the second statement nri deposits are permitted we saw in our discussion it is not permitted so statement 2 is incorrect okay now look at the third statement it is allowed to hold a maximum balance of rupees 5 lakh no we saw in our discussion that it is only rupees 2 lakh per individual customer so it is incorrect now look at the fourth statement it cannot issue credit or debit cards no it cannot issue only credit cards but it can issue debit cards okay so statement 4 is also incorrect now look at the fifth statement 
they can set up their own branches and atms yes they can set up their own branches and atms so statement 5 is correct see this type of question you can handle through elimination technique right so when we first found that the statement 2 is incorrect you can just arrive at the answer as option b 1 and 5 only is correct okay but as i always say go through the other statements before shading your final answer in the omr sheet okay now let's move on to our next question see this question is about a discussion regarding the spread level of the disease right we saw pandemic epidemic endemic right regarding that only this question is framed so look at the first statement the constant presence of a disease in a population within a geographical area is called epidemic is it epidemic we saw in a discussion that this definition is for endemic right so statement 1 is incorrect now as i said just go through the options try if you can eliminate the options yes you can eliminate right because the question is regarding the correct statements you found that the first statement is incorrect so eliminate option a b and d and you can easily arrive at the answer as option c 2 and 3 only but do remember to read out the remaining statements before shading your final answer okay see now read the second statement pandemic is when simultaneous epidemics occur in multiple locations across the globe yes it is correct third statement a pandemic can become an endemic yes it can become an endemic when it is reduced okay so option c 2 and 3 only is the correct answer now let's move on to our last article discussion it is a map based question and it is framed based on our galvan valley discussion okay see just recollect what we saw in a discussion galvan valley is located south of dbdo west of akshay chin east of kargil and north of darbuk so now come back to the question galvan valley is located to north of daulat beg oldi no it is incorrect south now second option it is west of akshay chin yes it is correct check with c and d options as well okay west of kargil no it is east of kargil option d south of darbuk no it is north of darbuk so our answer here is galvan valley is situated to the west of akshay chin option b is correct Displayed here are the mains practice questions. Please go through it and write your answers and post it in the comment box. If you like this video, do like, share, and comment. And don't forget to subscribe to our Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.